welcome to the Frontline Podcast, brought to you in association with the Atler Group. Atler Group is a collaboration of businesses with a collective history of over 130 years, bringing financial solution to its clients in the world of accountancy, audit, advisory, fiduciary and retirement benefit solutions. Visit atler.im today. On the Frontline Podcast, we chat to leaders in business and successful entrepreneurs to bring you their in-depth and bite-sized opinions that will add value to you and your mind. Well, thanks for joining me today. Appreciate your time. Welcome. Perhaps for our listeners, uh, a little bit of an introduction to yourself, uh, perhaps a bit about your background before you came to the Isle of Man. Okay, certainly. So uh, my name is Lyle Raxall. I'm currently Chief Executive of Digital Isle of Man. I uh, had quite a varied career in, in tech before I got here. Uh, started my career in air traffic control, um, uh, designing and, and installing air traffic control systems, um, uh, both in uh, what was then a, a, new, a new air traffic control centre at Swanwick uh, and the Scottish Air Traffic Control Centre as well, um, uh, mainly with responsibility for oceanic uh, traffic. So uh, one of my early projects was increasing the amount of traffic across the Atlantic, uh, for example, um, but a whole host of different things within uh, a period of time, about five years, I was in air, tra- air traffic control. Okay. Um, That's got a pr- fairly interesting w- and what's the, that project driver then? That's to just create more efficiencies in that space, more safety as well. I assume, obviously. Well, I think. I mean, this is this was all pre nine eleven, so this is uh, showing my age now, but it was, it was quite some time ago. But um, yeah, as as time goes on, more and more air travel is happening. Um, there's a need to what they call resectorize, which is to make the sectors that are managed by the air traffic controllers themselves smaller, so they can put more aircraft in it. Um, so there's a forever uh, resectorization happening to to make sure that's more manageable and they can manage with the increased air traffic. Um, Things like transatlantic uh, travel is a little bit more complex because there's no radar in the ocean. Um, they don't use GPS even today. There's no mandate to, to have to use that. So um, they use a, a slightly different system to manage uh, the quantity of traffic across the Atlantic. Um, and uh, it's really about managing risk and making sure that they have uh, risk mitigating factors in place and on the aircraft and in the control centers to be able to deal with any problems. Um, so it, it was an interesting uh, role. I was on a graduate program, so got well looked after, did a lot of training, uh, got taught to fly, got taught to do air traffic mm-hmm. control, uh, got went around the, the business and went around a lot of airports. Um, it was a lot of fun. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, you know, I think with a, a role like that, if you, it's very easy to do that for the rest of your life. Um, so after five years, it was a case of either I need to go and do something else uh, or uh, I'm going to be in, you know, in air traffic control for the re- remainder of my career. So I thought I would get out and do something else. Um, what did that entail? Uh, so uh, I was quite unsure when I got out. So I did a little bit in broadcasting, oddly. Um, uh, I used to sell uh, uh, broadcast equipment, particularly outdoor broadcast equipment, um, all of the overlays that goes on screens, the tech that did that, um, uh, outside audio broadcast equipment um, with... Uh, using 3G at the time, uh, which was still relatively new. I think and, I've heard of that. Yes. Um, uh, making sure you can compress the voice and get good quality voice at the, at the other end in, in a live broadcast. Uh, I didn't particularly like that uh, as a role. It was quite salesy um, and not particularly uh, technology focused. Uh, I did uh, build a website and uh, helped this particular company kind of expand its reach uh, and then went off and did a couple of my own businesses. Um, mm-hmm. So uh, I did a I think politely you could call it a dating agency. It was probably a little bit more um, uh, uh, focused than that. It was uh, based off the a few holiday experiences I had in Ibiza and Greek islands and things like that. Um, so I set up a uh, an agency in London, um, and we'd invite people to. It's called Date Party, mm-hmm. and we'd just have big parties with lots of single people, um, uh, which was uh, relatively successful. Uh, I was then concerned it wasn't grown up enough, so I went to do a another website, which was um, back in the days of Price Runner and uh, uh, yeah, sort of which websites, and it was a comparison website that told you where to get the best deals for tech goods and white goods and things like that. That was actually a disaster. Um, uh, didn't really get off the ground. Didn't make uh, any money off that. Um, so 
decided to go into uh, what well, needed to go and get another job so <laughs> I um, uh, did a bit of contract work for the UK government um, in Ofsted um, so Office of Standards of Education uh, they were doing a transformation program of the entire um, department uh, where they wanted to consolidate the amount of offices they had rework the way that they uh, managed the business how they ran the business uh, so I was one of three project managers that came in to run that for them uh, I was responsible firstly for uh, the Nottingham branch. They had th- a three branch strategy Bristol, Nottingham, Manchester. Um, and then once I t- completed Nottingham, I took over Manchester and then ended up taking over the program and, and got that delivered. Um, so, in, in that project environment, that'll be, you know, you're heading up a project, you've got various arms depending on whether it's the tech side, the logistical side I would guess things like that well to be honest not a great deal of tech apart from uh, not very exciting tech like mail readers and mail sorters Um, it was more facilities management it was uh, there was a lot of redundancies and lots of rehire so logistical in terms of business sense making sure there's a uh, transfer of knowledge making sure that that a culture change um, uh, exists and that the staff that are being retained their their, uh, expectations are managed they are excited about the future of the business. You know, any change of that size um, can really affect people on a very personal level. Uh, and even something that, as a project manager, I think is really exciting. We, we had offices designed by uh, the same people who did the Google offices in the UK. The funky colours and nice, you know, nice equipment and nice, uh, a nice feel in the office. Um, coming from quite a dark and dingy, typical what you'd expect a 1980s government office to look like, no air conditioning. And, um, uh, you know, I thought, what's not to like? But <laughs> there was there seemed to be plenty of things that people didn't like about that yeah. move. It's about, you know, that for me, that was my first programme where I really thought you need to, managing the human element of change is so mm. important. Um, I was going to expand a little bit on that. Actually, you talk about that culture change, something certainly out low where we're bringing businesses together uh, what yeah, I suppose I was going to ask what the kind of challenges you see in there uh, when you're doing that. I, mean, I presume there's many. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think uh, I mean this. I say this. That was really my first uh, strong business change, um, change management kind of program. So um, I did some very basic things in there, but you know, creating a blog, um, showing people the pictures, having samples of what the equipment and what the the wall coverings and and things are going to look like in the offices doing tours so by getting the buy-in is that yeah so you know what's in it for me essentially um so uh yeah as a business the the benefits might be very very obvious as an employee what what do you care about you care about do am i going to have a fridge to put my lunch in um is my you know am i going to have the same privacy as i had my old desk am i going to be sitting by the same people um these are you know these are all things that are often overlooked in the change journey um but uh you know if you if you don't manage that then you do end up with all sorts of issues Mm. um when you're trying to bring people in um so yeah, it's quite a learning experience. So, so just on, I suppose again, on that learning experience you mentioned there about the, the business that failed, I always think it's, uh, again, fail is often considered a, a bad thing, where it's really the reality is it's a good thing. Uh, would that be something you'd you'd agree with, having gone through uh, difficult times? Because they, they ultimately teach you things, I guess. Potentially, it doesn't always feel like that at the no, time. Um, sure. uh, st- certainly I have learned some long-lasting lessons from that. Um, there's no better way than to learn lessons than to lose your own money. Um, so uh, uh, it was it was helpful from, from that perspective. Uh, looking back, I can completely see what I did wrong. And what was quite interesting is, you know, I'm a career-long project manager. And yeah, I was still quite young at that stage. But everything that I tell people what to do and everything that I've guided people to do since, I, I made those mistakes. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, and sometimes when it's your own project, it's easy to uh, wing it rather than go through and, and do the proper steps and yeah. think about exactly what you're trying to achieve and why. Um, that was certainly the case uh, for me there. But, um, you know, it certainly wasn't the last time I failed. Um, uh, and, you know, there, there is, if you're not failing, then perhaps you're not, pushing yourself enough you're not taking enough risks it's about uh, you know failing in the right way making sure that you know the that that you you're wrapping up quickly you're not uh, flogging a dead horse you're not continuing to do something because you're your own stubbornness and that 
there was all, all, all of those kind of characteristics in me back then when yeah. I was uh, doing my own business. Um, uh, and it's probably something I should have given up on six months before I actually did. Yeah, right, okay. uh, and I would have uh, lost less money. Uh, but um, again, uh, th- these are valuable things. And you know, even in my role today, it's helpful to say, had a couple of my own businesses, one worked, one didn't. Um, and uh, these are why I'd be able to. Yeah, you yeah. got the scars from that. So, so bringing that in, you, you'd landed. What brought you to the island? Well, aside probably from the job, but what ended up landing landing in this beautiful place? Uh, well, I guess you know from uh, I, I I joined a consultancy, so I went into management consultancy after uh, my stint at Ofsted, and I was it was a project management focused uh, consultancy. So I did a lot of work in the UK government, and then into financial services uh, in London. I was part of the uh, ABN Amro RBS takeover, um, and. Uh, as government went on decline, a lot of consultants moved into financial services. Uh, so did a lot of work with RBS and Deutsche Bank um, uh, in the city. Uh, I ended up becoming joint head of financial services for London um, and then got offered a head of financial services for North America um, with an office on Wall Street, which I thought I couldn't refuse. Um, so I took the family over to uh, New York and we lived out there for a few years. Um, which I, I thoroughly enjoyed my time out there. My family thoroughly hated their time out there. Oh, really? Um, so uh, we, I had a three-year deal. We were going to try it for three years, uh, and if it didn't work, we'd come back. It obviously wasn't working for my family. Um, and rather than come back to, uh, to London, which was always the plan, uh, my wife, who was brought up on the Isle of Man, um, uh, suggested, you know, with two young kids, let's look at the Isle of Man. Um and I was a bit sceptical, to be honest, about what kind of work there was going to be. Um, didn't know, I knew very little about the island. Um, it's not New York. Uh, well, <laughs> yeah, I gathered that much. Um, but um, it didn't take me very long, actually. I, did, I, I, it threw family on the island. I got uh, shown the job that I've got now, and I applied for it. Um, but as I researched the job, and I literally had a weekend, I think, to pull together a presentation in terms of how... Uh, the Isle of Man's economy could be grown, um, which was a slightly different angle for me. But um, I phoned up a few people on the island uh, who were experts in e-gaming and media, um, and I'd already done some work in blockchain. Um, So I was uh, quite quickly kind of pulled together a a vision of what the island could look like. And it was actually quite exciting. Um, I was going to say, it was that, yeah. It was... uh, Juices flowing. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, it perhaps sounds... um, a bit detrimental but uh, again you know when you've knowing so little about the island and knowing it's a small place and only ever having worked in cities before um, I was genuinely surprised about how intelligent and business orientated and how much was happening on the island Um, and that's purely down to my own naivety uh, of not being aware of it and not really thinking about it I'd only seen the Isle of Man briefly, I think, when I was shutting down offices for IBS, and uh, I'd seen the Isle of Man was one of the you know branch offices at the time. Um, and other than that, it just never really crossed my mind. Um, actually, landing here and starting to talk to people um, was amazing. Um, it was shocking in a number of ways. Firstly, I think you know, going to New York and being a consultant, you're trying to sell services. So typically, people run in the opposite direction. Um, they don't want to talk to you. Um, and whether it's the culture of the Isle of Man or the nature of my job here, working for government, um, everybody just wanted to talk to me and uh, you know, understand more about me. Understand, you know, share what they wanted to see on the island and what their challenges were. Um, and it was a very collaborative kind of environment very friendly environment but also a very purposeful kind of conversation um it wasn't slow it wasn't um uh, there was a there was a need to move things forward and an ambition to move things forward um and that's been really really interesting to me um not something you've seen then in the particularly perhaps in the other environments you've been in uh, or not, not to the degree that's here. Nowhere near to the degree. I mean, the, you know, the competitiveness um, uh, and the one-upmanship and uh, all of that you can you expect in a city just didn't exist in the same way here. Um, also, this idea of Isle of Man PLC people working together for the greater good of the island was something I've never seen before. Um, you know, and I have I've run, I've run cross 
organizational working groups across banks in New York, and we've had like the meeting of minds. Um, but the collaboration uh, and the the vision of what could be achieved as a group was never as great as what I've seen here. Oh, that's nice to hear. Uh, so, uh, so, so is that timing wise? Was that that role or just around the time sort of stars aligning that you were looking to? Absolutely, yeah. I was just think, I was thinking about this recently. It was literally uh, I'd only been looking on the island, uh, and I wasn't looking that hard to be fair. Um, uh, so I was only looking for a matter of a few weeks, okay. and this job just happened to come up. Um, it's a new role; it didn't exist before. Um, and uh, I thought that looks interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, there was one for finance and one for digital. I actually applied for both of those, mm -hmm. um, but the digital one had quite a lot of variety in it. Uh, financial services on the other hand is very different to financial services I worked with in New York and London. Um, so, uh, but the digital just seemed to be a bit of a blank canvas. We had e-gaming uh, and we had uh, a, a, this legacy in media, but we didn't really have much else. Mm -hmm. Um, so that was quite interesting. Picking up on the blank canvas, and this obviously isn't an appraisal, yeah. but uh, on that day one of what you talked about and you wanted to deliver, how's that panned out, I suppose, and now what what we're looking at for the future of Digital Isle of Man? Um, well, perhaps set the scene about what digital the department is here for in regard to the government as well. Sorry, three yeah. questions in one. No, that's absolutely fine. So, uh, yeah, let me start with what's, what's the purpose of Digital Isle of Man? So, you know, essentially our purpose is to uh, you know, look after and grow the digital economy on the Isle of Man um, and that can be done in many ways in fact they're, 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 you know, we weren't given a roadmap of what this should look like uh, it was a case of here's the opportunity we have a, a huge e-gaming sector um, which is, it was actually a sector that I was not familiar with it's got a lot of synergies with financial services so uh, I understood that but um, very different culture and uh, and focus we need to make sure that we protected that. We didn't want to lose it. Um, so there's some diversification required. But you know, that was a very strong sector with strong credibility. It's quite an easy thing to kind of see what the future of that looks like. And there's many people on the island who have the answers to that because there's so much expertise here. Um, so that's, that, that's, that was a nice gift, I guess, kind of coming in that there was something that was established and working. Um, Media certainly had more challenges, and you know, coming in, we just uh, uh, there was a review from government about what to do with media and how we were going to fund it. So that did really prohibit how we moved forward, and we, we were working closely with a another organisation called Isle of Media at the time, trying to understand what place the Isle of Man could could uh, have in the media industry, and that that was a, quite a challenging um, uh, strategy to try to pull together. But we also had the opportunity, you know, we do have, still have the opportunity to do things new, you know, bootstrap new industries. Um, and there's lots of lots of exciting things that we can do. Um, we've got lots of capability on the island. The question is, how do you create a journey that makes sense? So for me, we're also an international finance center. Uh, we have a lot of expertise there. We've got some, uh, quite a bit of tech expertise. Um, there was a quite ambition when I came in to do something with blockchain. People were talking about blockchain. A few months earlier, I was working at the IMF in DC and uh, we were talking about blockchain there. So I'd actually heard, in fact, I sat at, 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 in a quite a senior meeting and uh, were trying to understand from an IMF perspective what advice they should give around blockchain. And um, they said, well, we need to watch the smaller jurisdictions and see what they do and use those as a weather vane to be able to then advise the larger jurisdictions. And then six months later I happened to be in one of these small jurisdictions um, so I actually felt that it was our responsibility to try to do something in this space um, so we uh, worked up a strategy in terms of how we could you know create uh, a uh, center for blockchain businesses on the Isle of Man and it's around providing certainty um, about making sure we we're open to a government that people didn't um, look at blockchain uh, businesses as any kind of second-class citizen or you know in a derogatory manner which was something that was happening quite a lot back then and it was only four years ago um, but there's quite a bit of stigma and there still can be around blockchain businesses so being quite open-armed welcoming saying as a government we welcome blockchain businesses the financial regulator is welcoming of blockchain businesses we have a path to regulation and to legitimization of your businesses 
Um, we worked with a on island entrepreneur to kind of create a soft landing space for businesses, um, so that they could come in and and coalesce, talk to like minded people. In that kind of scenario, you will expect quite a bit of failure um, with new businesses coming in. You want people to fail in a safe space so they can be picked up by other businesses. Um, and uh, that we created what we called at the time a blockchain office, um, which was a group of people that they could talk about how to set up the business, how to get support from the government, how to get support from the regulator, um, and you know, have a, a strong communication into um, the Isle of Man PLC. Um, if you look back over that period, is that do you feel that's that's happened? Looking back at that original email, yeah, I mean, I think it didn't all happen the way that we planned. Um, These things never do, you know. But uh, you know, we we have uh, probably more uh, crypto exchanges on the island per person than we, they do in in most other parts of the world. Certainly in the UK, um, we I think you, you recognise that we are considered a blockchain jurisdiction when. Uh, people like the Financial Times or the BBC approach us about talking to us about why is blockchain prevalent on the Isle of Man yeah. um, when we're not having to solicit those kind of uh, media conversations. Um, and even now we have a pipeline with a, quite a number of blockchain businesses in that we've not had to really chase to get here. They're coming to us now. Uh, so we've we've got Words I think out. yeah we've got we've gotten over the hump of having to create the momentum, um, and now that sector is what I call in digital Isle of Man terms a self-sustaining sector. If we backed off and uh, you know we we did less and we are doing less than that, that sector is still growing. There was a event uh, Isle of Man Business Network event last week around blockchain businesses coming together to talk about what they're doing that we didn't have any involvement in uh, and that's great to see because that that sector is looking after itself yeah. um, it's big enough to be able to do that we're always there to support it and we are still proactively looking at what else we can do um, we've learned a lot of lessons I think the regulators learned a lot of lessons and we're now working together to say well how do we take those lessons and do more with it so we're looking now to expand that to uh, a fintech um, a proposition because Blockchain essentially is a fintech, um, certainly the way that it's being uh, brought on the island. We had hoped there'd be lots of use cases for just vanilla DLT, um, uh, but that's not happened on the island. It's been very crypto focused. But well, that does mean we've got a lot of lessons learned with the regulator. They've got a lot of, um, uh, they, we're, they're trying to think about how to work differently. We're trying to think about how we work differently. Um, so we have a joint two joint initiatives with the FSA and finance Isle of Man. Uh, one is uh, we're, uh, we did announce at our digital Isle event in November that we were going to run a fintech innovation challenge. We've just done a series of workshops with the on-island on -island businesses around that. Um, I have a report coming back uh, to outline what the challenges that those uh, uh, workshops have worked together to identify for the Isle of Man. And we're looking to launch that fintech um, innovation challenge um, uh, in the next couple of months. And also alongside that, we are working with the Isle Man FSA to consider what we call an innovation hub. So a way for Finance Isle Man, Digital Isle Man, who are the business development um, sort of arm of this and um, with, uh, work with the FSA, who obviously are, are regulating it, to create a mechanism for businesses to come in and for us to understand what their needs are, whether our regulation is appropriate. Um, and sometimes we have to say no to people because we, we don't feel it's the right thing for the island. But what we don't have at the moment is a mechanism to say, well, we've seen the same thing three or four times. Should we actually consider making something and making this fit? For yeah, the flex, yeah, creating some regulations um, or yeah. flexing regulations to um, fit. And there needs to be a feedback loop back to you know uh, the, the, the regulatory side of the business to say, you know, this 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 entry point in could be smoother. We could be doing this instead. The conversations could be different, um, or we know that this is a barrier that we need to address. Um, so that that would then create a formal mechanism for us to create a smoother, easier process for businesses. And when when do people come into the Alaman? Certainly, the one thing we see in the financial side is that it's a very two way conversation as well with. Uh, people come into the Alman. Are you finding the feedback you get from businesses coming here that that's a refreshing change for them? Because certainly the vibe I get from perhaps other jurisdictions is it's they're pushing water up a hill where we're, 
and the government here are very, it's a very much two way conversation. Yeah, I mean, I think you know we have uh, different sectors all have different vibes when they kind of come in. So certainly with blockchain, typically we, we're working with people who've been trying to work with the FCA for a period of time, and uh, it feels like it's going nowhere, or you know they, they have a lack of certainty about what their business is going to to look like. Um, and then when they come here, it's easy to talk to people. It's easy to talk to the regulator. Yeah. Um, and we've got much better than that as, on the island as well. You know, three years ago, I wasn't allowed to, to talk about a sandbox and we didn't really have a, a clear vision of exactly what that is. Now we have a sandbox and people are going through it. Um, you know, we just had the, the in the sandbox now is the first sort of GBP pegged stable coin. Um, we have other people looking to go through their sandbox as well. That's great. You know, we're now having collaborative discussions. We're looking at uh, what's the best for the island, what's the best for those businesses. Um, and from our perspectives as Digital Isle of Man, one of the big learnings we had probably in after the first 18 months to two years is um, businesses are used to jurisdictions courting them and telling them to come here and how great everything is going to be. And then often when they turn up to a jurisdiction, they may it may not quite be as great as it sounds. So we've tried to turn that around and actually our number one priority is to look after the businesses that are here. Um, and that kind of sells itself. Um, so if the businesses here are happy, they feel that they've got a good relationship and they feel that the government is helping them grow um, and not just create competition. And I don't think businesses here are adverse to competition, but they want to have a chance to expand their own businesses mm -hmm. as well. And if we're putting that first, that becomes a much stronger proposition for us than trying to throw money at people and grants and things to come here and do something new that perhaps businesses here can already do. Yeah. Um, so that's been the, uh, that's been really really helpful. And what it means is when we've got to bring those businesses in, it's a big part of what our role. We have a, an accelerator program where we'll introduce them around to other businesses who can help support them or they can bring in that collaborative approach we talked about. The exactly. Outside, the element gen yeah. generally has. Um, and that's what people are like, wow, there's so many things that can happen when I come to the Isle of Man. You know, suddenly I've got a marketplace that I perhaps didn't know existed, or I've got ideas so I can take my product or service in a new direction than I'd anticipated. Mm. And then once you have that, you've got your case studies, you've got the credibility, and then you can then springboard into other jurisdictions and other markets as well. Yeah. Um, you know, this is, it's, it's an easy place to grow or start a business, um, easy great place to prove what you can do um, before you then go on to perhaps uh, yeah. a harder, harder jurisdictions to penetrate. Yeah, okay. And then just a couple of, couple of other quick questions just to finish off. Challenges you, you're finding in the space? Because again, every, every, we, all, we all have them in some capacity. Uh, so there's, again, so, so, so many uh, uh, challenges. I think sometimes it's getting out of the weeds. So we, particularly on new strategies, so we, we're creating new strategies on IoT, um, on esports, um, and uh, sometimes you can get yourself down in the weeds, and you have to remind yourself why why are we doing this? Um, and from our perspective, the only reason we're doing anything is for the betterment of the the economy and and for businesses on the island. So if businesses don't want it, so what what are our local businesses going to get out of esports? Is is a common question. Um, well, there's a lot what we do now. The, uh, for e-gaming and the journey we've been on with e-gaming for the last 20 years which is absolutely aligned with what esports is going through there are absolutely some differences as well there's a cultural difference there's language differences but ultimately a lot of the things we can do as an island um, uh, are things that will support the esports industry mm. they're quite boring things uh, in terms of when you think of esports it's not big stadiums filled with people and lots of flashing lights and, and things like that but these businesses need a help, a lot of help to drive what our global businesses, move people around, pay people, look after people, protect people. Um, uh, there's a lot of bad actors. There's no real regulation in that mm -hmm. space. So they're having the same issues that e-gaming had before that was legitimized uh, through regulation. Um, and uh, our businesses here have been through it once. They've got all of the products that will apply to a new market. So actually, it's just expanding their marketplace um, yeah. and doing what they're already very good at. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. So one last quick question. Obviously, in various roles in this role here, you're leading people in leadership, and it's a very open question in regard to leadership. But it's something I like to chat to guests about. What's your 
uh, sort of tips for being a leader? What do you know? Do you lead by example? Are you how, how would you best describe yourself? I think find, people find it hard to answer that question about themselves, but it is it is hard. I think um, you know what, one of the the challenges that uh, I think you know, people have going through their career is the role changes and uh, how you know moving into the leadership uh, uh, space is quite difficult. Um, when you know I've been doing I've been running projects and large programs for twenty years, that takes a certain amount of willpower and focus uh, to keep a team moving towards a goal um, the difference with project management especially when you're in uh, you know your your consultancies are, are short-term engagements um, you're working in big cities where there's a lot of ambition and people are cycling through your company generally quite quickly or a step on their career ladder, ladder is that takes a lot of energy and focus and resilience when you come into uh, a leadership role and you're looking after a team long term that pace that focus doesn't work because people burn out yeah. um, and I think uh, you know that's that's always a hard thing to do as a leader is to try to temper yes we need to deliver results um, I am very delivery focused I want our team to be very delivery focused I want us to be successful but at the same time we need to do that in a sustainable way where people feel they want to come to work that it makes sense for them that they're empowered to do what they need to do um and uh you know that they they have the ability to create their own plans and hit the, the objectives in the right way albeit within a framework of larger organizational objectives that's been a challenge i think coming to the island was a challenge because culturally it's different um but you know that i think a good leader can listen to their team about what their team wants and make sure that they can uh, change the tempo change the approach based on on how that team wants to work so i think it's important to make sure you can go away and have honest conversations around what works for you what yeah. doesn't um you know what would you like to see what could we do better um and allow people to be part of the uh improvement uh sort of that continuous improvement process of how an organization works yeah, absolutely um, but yeah, it is it is tough, and you know people are all different. They all want different things, and trying to uh, grow a team because we've been growing a lot as well. Uh, that's quite diverse and has all these different things. Um, it, it takes quite a degree of focus to kind of make try to keep all those plates spinning and and make it that people feel their job is worthwhile and they're happy and they're fulfilled yeah absolutely. Um, it's it's uh it's an interesting challenge yeah, absolutely <laughs> so anybody looking to reach out to to, to the digital agency I presume what web, web's the best place to start reach uh, out and certainly from my experience all very approachable and just drop your line and set up a call type arrangement absolutely yeah i mean we are through the website easy way to contact us we have a team of strategic partners who uh, that you know, we look up everyone. Everyone that we know who's in the digital space, we create an account. We make sure they're looked after. They have touch points. Um, we agree with them how much, how what kind of interaction they want. Uh, anybody new coming in who's interested, to, uh, who you know, or perhaps on the Isle of Man who don't know us already, or want to come to the Isle of Man, then again, reach out through the website. The team are amazing at, at really you know, helping people through those journeys solving some of the problems, asking questions, introducing them to people who can make their life easier. Um, that's what we're here to do. It's just uh, it's to make that journey as, as simple as possible um, and make sure that you're, you know, you need to come to the island scratching your head with nothing to do. <laughs> Where do I start? Uh, exactly. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's it's not just us. It's all those businesses as well. You know, everybody's keen to meet, uh, you know, new people come to the island and understand how best to work with them. Yeah, great. Thanks for coming in, Lon. Very much appreciated. You're welcome. Thank you. Thanks for listening, everyone.